Games are clearly not just for awkward family gatherings anymore. Um, our next speaker will share with us that that is the case and that that's a good thing. Because games and gamification turn out to be great motivating forces for action and change, gamification is the process of using game thinking and game dynamics to engage people and solve pro problems. And speaker Gabe Zickerman is an expert on gamification as well as the author of the upcoming book, The Gamification Revolution. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Gabe Zickerman. Thanks so Thanks. much. Well, hi, everybody. Um, since it was such a Monopoly-friendly crowd, I, um, I don't know how many of you know this, but Monopoly was originally conceived as an anti-capitalist teaching tool. That's, it's true. That's the reason why the way the game plays is eventually one person has all the money and everyone is bankrupt. Yeah. It's actually the story of it. Um, so I'm really excited to be here in this uh, very theatrical crowd. Um, and I, I was struck by, I'm struck by... Um, my learning about a particular uh, theatrical concept, which is the fourth wall. And the fourth wall I learned about for the first time um, when I was out, I was out with uh, my ex-partner at his ex-boyfriend's theater company in Brooklyn, <laughs> watching, yes, yes, I know, it's already a good setup. Um, <laughs> in midsummer, with no air conditioning, watching an updated version of Victor Victoria. Which is funny because I always, like, I guess as a kid, whenever I, whatever, it was playing on TV or something, I thought it was actually a good show. Um, but so we're watching, we're watching this version of Victor Victoria, and at one point in the middle of the show, a set piece fell. And instead of doing what I had always thought was the thing that you were supposed to do, which is just pretend that that didn't happen or incorporate that action somehow in a natural way, in an improvisational way, the show kind of stopped. And the players in the show didn't know what to do when eventually the stage manager came out and said, sorry, our set's not working. We'll be back in a few minutes. I know, right? Total amateur hour. So, <laughs> so, I, was like, so I was like, okay, sorry if any of you are from this theater company. Um, so I was like, okay, so, so you know, and then, and then I got a quick education in the meaning and definition of the fourth wall, uh, being that thing that, you know, we're supposed to keep up to uh, prevent ourselves from. Um, you know, bleeding between the virtual world and the real world, bleeding between the make-believe and the real place. And it seems like, to me, that concept of the fourth wall actually um, is no longer really even, like, possible for us to maintain for any length of time at all. It feels like we're in the middle of what could best be described as a significant engagement crisis. And I don't know if you all feel this the same way that I feel it, but it seems like it's very difficult to maintain people's attention for any length of time at all. And now we have some data that actually is starting to show us how difficult it is to maintain people's attention. So it's not just kind of a heuristic feeling, there's actually data. So one of my favorite pieces of research, Microsoft research says, 98% of people will decide in less than 10 seconds whether or not they're interested in your website. In less than 10 seconds. And I, I don't know, it makes me feel a little old, but I, it wasn't that long ago. It took longer than 10 seconds for a web page to load. Uh, and so how quickly, right, this has transitioned. Or, fascinating stat from Nielsen just from a few weeks ago, 80% of the population has, in the last 30 days, watched broadcast entertainment with a second or third device open at the same time. Sometimes called second screening, yeah? Now, again, making me feel old. Do you remember when TV was the distraction itself? <laughs> like, and we didn't need like a distraction from the distraction to feel like we were engaged and entertained for uh, 22 minutes, right? I mean, insane. Or this one, which was kind of shocking. Today, 20% of the population checks their smartphone every 10 minutes of every day from the moment they wake up to the time they go to bed. That is 100 checks of their smartphone. I know exactly which one of you that is, by the way, I can tell from here. Um, and that's only 20% of the group. I'm not even, you know, I'm not talking about the averages, I'm just talking about, you know, this top 20%. And so, we arrive at this interesting moment, <laughs> we arrive at this sort of interesting moment in time, and I want to share just like a couple of anecdotes, stories that illustrate this for me. So, 
A few months ago, a major car company, one of the world's largest car manufacturers, came to me, as they sometimes do in my practice, and said, Gabe, we have an engagement problem. Can you help us understand how to fix it? And I said, what is it? And they said, for the first time in the history of the United States, teenagers no longer want to drive. The rate of teenage desire to drive is on the decline. This has never happened before. And I said, this is really interesting. What's going on? The research says there's environmental reasons and money reasons why teens don't want to, but the number one reason is, and for good reason, they cannot be on Instagram and text and be on Facebook while driving, and so they are choosing to Instagram instead of drive. <laughs> True story, some of you have teenagers who you've probably seen the behavior. And so they compete, it's not that they don't get why cars are important, it's that they're competing to not be the person driving so they can do the other activity that they find more pleasurable. And so one of the core lessons that I take away from that is never underestimate the hedonistic desire of people to follow the path that delivers the most pleasure. And we'll talk about that some more. Another kind of interesting allegory, because I've been talking about kind of the negative stuff, right? That's all the terrible stuff. But on the plus side, some of this is connected to something really sort of a really interesting kind of uh, behavior. So I'm watching this TV show uh, called The Aviators. It's a Canadian-American documentary series about aviation. And uh, the voice of the announcer, the voice of God, comes on and it says, what would happen if we took a 12-year-old boy off the street and asked him to land a commercial jetliner? And so I was like, all right, you have my attention. <laughs> okay, you got it. Stopped, I stopped Instagramming for a second. I was like, what's going on? So they grab this kid. This, his name is Remy. He's 12 years old. They grab him off the street. They pull him into a flight simulator, professional flight simulator the same exact ones that the pilots who flew you here and fly you around have to certify on twice a year, every year, to be able to do that. And two minutes and 40 seconds later, Remy puts the plane down, a 737 down, at Los Angeles International Airport. And my jaw hits the floor. Friends, I grew up in an aviation household. My father spent 40 years working for Air Canada. I am, and I fly all the time, and I know a lot about AV, like I'm a huge AV nerd. But like, if the pilots are sick from eating bad fish, do not come to me looking for someone to land a plane. I could not possibly do this. Some of you have seen airplanes, so you got that reverend. I, I could not possibly do this. How is it possible that a 12-year-old kid can do this with absolutely no practice? And they go to the guy who runs the simulator company, and they say, how is this possible? And he's like, ah, oh, yeah, you know. He's like, we get some private clients in here every once in a while. These 10, 12-year-old kids with all their video game experience, they sit down, they land those planes, no problem. It's their parents that have the problem. And I was like, oh, how interesting. Maybe games are changing people's behavior. Maybe there's some connection uh, between all of these things. And in fact, there's a tremendous connection between these things. It's the power of games that's both producing this extraordinary next generation of high-functioning, super-fast people who don't have the same problems with the same stuff that we have, and our inability to focus and pay attention and do things the way that we used to do them, to give things our undivided attention for a period of time. But I'm not just talking about entertainment games, like video games and the kinds of things that you probably think that I mean. I'm also talking about all kinds of applications and experiences that take their cue from games. So for example, Instagram. Doesn't feel like a game immediately, but you'll notice almost instantly a scoreboard that's omnipresent every time you look at Instagram. Or Mint.com, a personal finance software that's revolutionized the way people get their uh, manage their finances that's full of game concepts like challenges and achievements and points. Or Foursquare, which created a whole industry out of an activity that still doesn't make much sense, checking in in the real world, <laughs> by using game concepts like badges to engage people. Or Nike Plus, which has changed the definition of what it means to be an athletics company by shifting attention from the apparel to a piece of software that's primarily a game that now has driven the company back into the top of the rankings for athletics, athletics organizations, changing the whole equation. All through this process is broadly speaking called gamification. And this is this, this notion embodied in one idea. And what gamification actually means is it's the use of game concepts, game thinking, game mechanics, game ideas, the best ideas from games, loyalty programs, and behavioral economics to engage audiences and solve problems. It is a process, critically, not a product. We never arrive at gamification station. We don't get to that point where everything is just done. And we don't sprinkle magic game fairy dust on things. 
and have them suddenly be awesome. Okay? We, it's a process of continuous improvement to use these ideas from games. If we do our jobs right, if we do our jobs right, and we focus on measure, metrics of engagement, which we define as recency, frequency, duration, virality, and ratings, these are five metrics that give us a composite picture of engagement, we can expect, using good gamification within a year, to raise those engagement metrics by about 30%. But I do want to just do a brief kind of uh, side story for you guys, important point, which is that um, being successful at something like gamification or any kind of engagement process that you might be undertaking is principally predicated on defining the metrics very, very clearly that you're attempting to shift right at the, from the get-go. That's not the like fun game design work, that's the like in the trenches work, but you've got to define those metrics. And you have to define how you're going to track those metrics. And you have to start seeing those metrics as a funnel that takes you from low engagement to high engagement. Do you notice what metric is not on this board? Something is conspicuously missing, right? It's sales. Sales is not on this board. Revenue is the product of engagement. It is the product of engagement. It is not the start of engagement. It's not the catalyst for engagement. It's what happens after you engage people. We too often use that as the start point. That's when someone is a customer, right? When they first pull out their credit card, they become a customer way before that. And that credit card process is the culmination of a process of engagement, not its beginning. And the sooner we start to think like the games companies that have pioneered this funnel, the better off we are. OK, a couple of things that gamification is not. It's not just about throwing some badges up on your website. Now, many of you, I'm sure you're giggling because you've seen many examples of gamification that really just focus on badges. And let me be clear, badges are super important, OK? If you've been in the military, you know someone who's in the, uh, one of scouting organizations, Badges are important when they're meaningful, but they're not enough in and of themselves to create a gamified system. They don't create engagement just by being. The second thing that gamification is not, and this is really the hard one, it's not about turning everything into a game. Okay? And this is a little difficult, I get that, but it's not about turning everything to, into a game. Turning everything into a game is like the equivalent, the engagement design equivalent of like put a bird on it or I can pick, <laughs> I'll pickle it, right? Like, it's like a, a kind of hipster trope that takes gamification in a place that isn't the right answer. And so if you take away one thing from today's conversation that's really important to me, I do not want you to run back to your community, run back to your theater group, and, you know, and go, you know what, guys, I get it. I saw a game, it's awesome, we're going to become a games company. Okay, <laughs> do not do that. Do not do that. What you need to do is do your mission, fulfill your objective, fulfill your mission, but use the best ideas from games to accomplish your business objectives. That rarely means making an actual game. All right? So I just want to briefly introduce myself for those of you who don't know me. Um, if you didn't read anything, I, I, I'm Gabe Zickerman. Um, I'm the author of three books on the subject of gamification. My latest book called The Gamification Revolution comes out this April, published by McGraw-Hill. I edit the main website on the subject at gamification.co if you're interested in more information. I run a company called Dopamine, which is a strategic consultancy. Uh, we help a whole bunch of businesses, big and small, apply gamification to all kinds of problems. Um, I also run this cool conference called G-Summit. Um, and it's happening this year in April. It brings together all these gamification experts from all around the world in San Francisco. I hope that you can come, um, but I totally, and if you can, please do. But if not, I, I want to call out this URL for one reason, which is I'm going to show you a bunch of examples of gamification to get you thinking about how people have done it and how they've used it. That URL contains in-depth videos by most of the examples I'm going to show you today. So you can go and watch full-length discussions from the designers of these experiences and get deeper on the subject of how gamification works and what people have done to be successful creating engagement using these techniques. So I encourage you to check that out even if you can't join us um, in April. Um, and, but if you do join us in April, you can actually earn a certification in gamified design, which is pretty cool, and do like a whole workshop with me all day uh, where we'll actually gamify something together it's awesome. All right. Um, so before we talk about the examples, let me explain the science of why gamification works. It's important science, and I like science. Um, so there's lots of different parts of our neurochemistry that respond well to games and gamified concepts, but there's one that's really super important that we talk about a lot, and that's called intrinsic reinforcement. And here's how intrinsic reinforcement works. It's so cool. OK. Anytime you challenge yourself to something, anything at all, 
and then you achieve that thing, your brain secretes a little bit of a magical neurochemical called dopamine, right? Now, many of you will remember or know from your pot smoking days <laughs> that, dopamine, that dopamine is a pleasure chemical. So, challenge, achievement, ah, pleasure. And the next thing that happens when the pleasure centers of your brain are triggered is you say, please, ma'am, may I have another, right? We're naturally attracted to that idea. And now the science tells us that it's not only the actual achievement of the challenge, but the anticipation of achieving it that triggers dopamine to be released in our brain. Now, here's what's kind of interesting, a couple of interesting things. The first one is, this occurs whether or not the thing that we are doing, whether the challenge achievement thing that we're doing is good or bad. It doesn't matter. It's simply the act of challenging yourself to do something and achieving it that produces this result which I think explains why so many things in the world are so awesome and also fucked up at the same time. <laughs> Number two, and this is, this is of particular importance to those of you who think actively about designing experiences for your community, how many times can you get this shot of dopamine in the real world? Like, how many times can you beat your personal best at a marathon? How many times can you learn a new language? How many times can you win a Tony Award? For some of you, I'm sure it's in the dozens. You, but it's not that easy to earn this dopamine release in the real world. You're lucky if in your job and from your relationships and from your social network, you get this once every quarter, once a year, right? But in the virtual world, in the game world, you get this release sometimes hundreds of times per hour. And game designers, video game designers, engineer this for maximum effect. They're literally deliberately designing experiences to maximize the dopamine release from challenge and achievement. And so can you. Um, so I want to talk about a couple of examples that I think you'll find uh, particularly interesting. So this is one of my favorite examples. This is called Speed Camera Lottery, for those of you that uh, haven't heard of it before. We all know what a speeding camera is, right? They're kind of a global, terrible global phenomenon um, in which if you're driving too quickly past the point of control, uh, your picture is taken, your license plate photo is taken, and you get this big nasty ticket in the mail. Okay, so in the Nordic countries like Sweden, the ticket that you get is not based on how fast you're going, it's based on how much money you make. So Sweden in 2010 gave out a $250,000 ticket. True story. I'm sure it was the president of Ikea. Uh, <laughs> or one of the members of ABBA or Nina Cherry or someone like that. Uh, Bjorn Borg. I'm going to dig in my Swedish pile for that one. Um, so set against this backdrop, a guy named Kevin Richardson, as part of a contest, is asked to reimagine the speeding camera. And he comes up with this concept called speed camera lottery. And here's how it works. It's brilliant. It's amazing. So instead of you driving by the speeding camera above the speed limit and then getting this, your picture taken, this nasty giant ticket in the mail, the way speed camera lottery works is anyone who drives by the speeding camera at or below the limit is automatically entered into a lottery to split the proceeds of the people who speed. <laughs> right? Right? Okay. So now, let me ask you a question. Which one of the two speeding control measures do you think works better? Right? One, we trust you, you're totally a good person, but oh, if you mess up, we're going to fuck you. <laughs> or, slow, drip-wise, positive social reinforcement for every good action that you take, followed by a punishment if you don't comply. Now, it's obvious this one, right? Because it's up on the board and I'm here presenting to you. So it's clearly this one, but let me describe how well. This thing, speed camera lottery, reduces speeding by 20 kilometers per hour at the point of intervention with no supplemental marketing whatsoever, just this on a corner. This is the most successful speeding intervention in the history of humanity. Let me tell you without bluster, the United States has changed its speed limit three times in the last 50 years. It has had zero effect on the average speed of the American driver. <laughs> study after study shows that none of those things will change people's behavior, not speeding fines, not cameras, not the speed limit, none of it will change behavior. But this does. And it does it by using an elegant concept from games, which is the slow and consistent positive reinforcement of users along the way. It's been so successful, I'm sure it'll come to the U.S. around 2075 or something. Uh, once, once we stop being so upset that it came from Sweden. Um, another good example, I, I don't have a ton of time, but I want to share these other examples with you. So another kind of fun example is, uh, this is uh, Domino's made this game called Pizza Hero. And basically, 
in the game, uh, effectively you play a pizzaiolo, so you make pizzas, and then whatever pizza it is that you make, uh, you can actually click a button and automatically have that ordered at Domino's. You've got to be able to do it well in order to be able to do it, but whatever it is that you make from the game. And if you do well, you also have the opportunity to apply for a job at Domino's. <laughs> it's true. Uh, in the first like six weeks, this was a multi-million dollar uh, revenue channel for Domino's, and uh, they've recruited a large number of people using the product. Um, it's kind of an interesting example of it to me. I don't know if we're, uh, we're in the market to get a job at Domino's, but um, it is, remember how I said don't make a game out of it? So that Domino's example is a little bit contradictory to that because they made a game out of it and they were really successful. Um, but what, that's, that's kind of the exception that proves the rule in my mind. If you're gonna actually make an actual literal game to express the engagement project that you're trying to create, um, then you're gonna need to devote a ton of resources to that and that's gonna probably be outside the scope of what most uh, community theater organizations are capable of doing. So it's important to remember that if you wanna make a game, uh, you know, you're gonna have to have those resources. Now, anything that we design that's highly engaging generally has three core characteristics of it, three core features. Feedback, friends, and fun. We call these the three Fs. Seems pretty straightforward, right? But any system that we put feedback, friends, and fun into is gonna get, keep, and sustain people's engagement over the long term. Now, feedback and friends are pretty straightforward, right? The system telling you how you're doing and your friends, your social graph, fun is a little bit more squirrely because fun is a little bit different for everybody. Now, it's not the pure snowflakes model, so there's big buckets of things that people find fun. I want you to look at, think about some of these examples that I'm gonna talk about and think about how they possess feedback, friends, and fun and how you can bring that into every aspect of what you do. So we talked a little bit uh, already about Nike, the transformation there. Um, you know, that they have about five million people using Nike Plus today. And I don't wanna belabor the point, but uh, when Nike Plus was launched just about five years ago, a little hardware device that you put on your body and uh, software that gives you a ton of feedback, just tells you how you're doing all the time and how you're progressing and how you're, uh, how you're achieving your personal best. Nike was not the preeminent brand for hardcore runners. That was New Balance when Nike Plus was launched. And they've absolutely recaptured that from New Balance by reimagining what it means to actually be in the sports and apparel business. Nike is in the business of wish fulfillment. Their products facilitate wish fulfillment. This is the conduit by which people get to express their desire to be exceptional, be good, to beat their personal best. And they get that feedback in the system constantly from having done that. Another example related to this, which I think is a great one and um, really interesting, comes from a company called Next Jump, based out of New York. This is Next Jump's founder, Charlie Kim. Uh, Charlie believes he's incredibly inspiring. Char Charlie believes that his employees should be fit. Uh, and he believes that for their own good, but also it's good for the company. Lower absenteeism, um, you know, better performance, because there's all this research that says uh, people who work out regularly are cognitively superior uh, to people who don't. Uh, which is a huge problem for me. Um, but so, so Charlie wanted his employees to work out on a regular basis. So he did what most companies or organizations do when they want to accomplish that. He put a gym in every one of his four offices. Yeah? And so what he found was immediately he got those people that had the expensive Equinox gym memberships, stopped going to the paid gym, and started going to the free gym. Small number of, of people. So he thought, okay, I want to raise engagement with the concept of working out. So I'm gonna do what most of you are probably inclined to do when you first think about raising people's engagement. He ran a contest. So he put aside 20,000 bucks, which is an amazing number. He put out $20,000 and said, okay, the members of my team who go to the gym the most often, the five or six top people, will split this $20,000 prize at the end of the year. And he got 12% of the employees to go to the gym on a regular basis, that's two or more times per week. Now that's already pretty awesome. That is a big behavior change in an organization. But Charlie's a pretty driven guy, and he was like, I think we can do better than that. So he introduced two game mechanics to the office. The first one was he let people play in teams. And the second one was he gave them a leaderboard so they could compare their team performance against other teams. Today, over 80% of Next Jump employees go to the gym more than two times per week on average. You have never been in an environment like that before in your life. Your gym doesn't have that many people going to the gym on a regular basis. <laughs> it's true. By the way, I looked this up. The American Association of Gym Owners says that a third of gym users in the United States only go once per year to the gym. So just to put that into perspective, colossal behavior change. So how Charlie accomplished this is important to note. The first thing that he did was he invoked our tribalism. 
Tribalism is an important characteristic. It's got to be organic, it can't be forced. But think about during the Olympics, right? Even people who could give a crap about you know, nationalism are waving their flag during the Olympics, right? Tribalism evokes something important. And then you let those tribes kind of compete with each other uh, in an organic sort of way using that leaderboard. This was very powerful. But also, and equally important is what Charlie didn't do. He didn't mandate that anybody go to the gym, which is key, right? Because forcing people to do something, even a, playing a game, uh, isn't, generally speaking, the best way to uh, navigate the waters of convincing people to do stuff. Even if a game is super fun, telling them you have to play it will, by definition, reduce its interest. So um, it's, it's an important lesson to understand about how we do that stuff. Or another example, kind of more from the marketing side that I thought you would find interesting, comes from Tabasco. You're familiar with the hot sauce people. So they were like, OK, well, I think that the use of the Tabasco hot sauce could be kind of a concept, a rubric for a community, because people who like hot sauce are kind of cool, and they're going to be connected with each other. So they basically created a virtual point system out of drops of hot sauce. So you use a Facebook app, the Tabasco Nation app, and you go there, and basically like every drop of hot sauce that you use, uh, you accrue a point for. And then you can do all these challenges in the real world, like put hot sauce on cake, and like take pictures of yourself you know, using hot sauce in Paris, whatever the case may be, earn these points, redeem them for really cool experiences. Um, and uh, Tabasco actually has added almost a million Facebook followers, a million Facebook fans, as a result of this campaign. They have raised engagement uh, 2x using Tabasco Nation. It seems obvious to me that your hardcore fans, I, I'm not advocating that you build a Tabasco Nation, but your hardcore fans are as interested in some incremental way of engaging uh, with their activity as anybody who uses hot sauce, at minimum. So there's some interesting kind of design lesson in there for all of us. Now, uh, one of those design lessons is a thing called the desire engine. And this comes from a guy named Nir Eyal. He's a regular speaker at uh, G Summit. He'll be speaking about it again. So he defined this concept called the desire engine, which helps explain how we get people to engage with the system over the long term. And he described that it starts with a trigger. And that trigger can be internal or external. I want to do this thing, or the system tells me, hey, you should do this, or a friend says, hey, you should do this thing. And then in response to that trigger, uh, you get the user takes an action. And in response to that action, the user gets a variable reward, a kind of reward that they can't exactly predict. And as a result of that, they have to recommit to the thing. And if they recommit to the thing at that moment, they're then put back in another loop uh, to that trigger, kind of over and over and over again. And this is the basic mechanics of creating a kind of engagement system that drives uh, repeat actions from users over time. You have to think about things like users re-upping their commitment. They need to make an active commitment to you in response to you prompting them to do something in order to get them to return to the system every time. Another kind of design framework that's important or concept that's important for us to understand in doing gamification is the notion of autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Now, I don't know if you guys have read Dan Pink's book, Drive. It's a great book. And he talks a lot about autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And that's a key element of what it is that we use uh, in gamification to design interesting experiences. So one of the uh, more interesting examples from this comes from IBM. And they built this internal tool to do business process engineering. It's a game called Innovate. And so at one point, they thought, well, let's take this game, this business process game, and throw it up on the web and just kind of see what happens when we throw it up on the web. And so they manifested it as this game that you can play uh, for city managers. So it's a business like SimCity, if you've ever played that, but for people who actually run cities. Um, <laughs> they, threw up, they threw that up on the web. And today, over 1,000 institutions use Innovate around the world to teach and practice BPM, business process engineering. It has also become IBM's number one lead generation tool worldwide. So the lesson there, which is really interesting, and you can see Fedra uh, talk about this this year at the conference, um, one of the things that's really interesting about the IBM example is if you have a center of excellence around engagement, so if you become an expert at engagement inside of your organization, you can actually take that expertise and monetize it with other organizations who will want to understand how you did what you did. And there's an early opportunity now in many categories, I'm sure in many of your regions, to be able to do that. Another example of this that I find also very interesting comes from the German engineering firm Siemens, who most of you probably know. So Siemens made this game called Plantville. Sounds like Zynga's Farmville a little bit, but not quite. It's a game that you play online 
where you manage a plant or factory or some kind of facility like that, and you model it, and you move objects through it, and so on and so forth. So right now, as we're sitting here, 25,000 people are approximately are playing plant bill online with Siemens. And of those, four-fifths are people who manage plants in real life. <laughs> so let me get this straight. Let's see if we all get this together. You go, you work, you run that factory from 9 to 6, you come home, you grab a slice of pizza, you sit down in front of the computer, and you play factory manager all night long <laughs> until your spouse peels you away from the machine and tells you it's time to go to bed. Now, this doesn't make any sense on the surface when you first hear this. This is crazy. Why would somebody do this hours a day? And the truth is, it's, what it embodies is an important thing about gamification for your audiences, for your employees, for everyone, which is games allow us to experiment in a safe way with different modes of operation of our job, of our lives, of the things that we do. They allow us to fail safely. They allow us to try and stretch and pull the world in different ways that we can't do in our regular job. Uh, okay, so think about it for the, uh, for the plant manager for a second. Let's say you're like a nuclear plant manager, right? So every day you go into your job and you hope to God that today is not the day that the plant melts down, right? But you kind of hope it is. A little bit, right? Because it would be kind of awesome if the plant melted down. But it would be terrible if the plant melted down. But it would also be awesome if the plant melted down. It's completely understandable. You've trained for that your whole life, right? You've been doing that job forever. You can't actually have the plant melt down in real life, but you can on plant bill. And so you get to see how to do that. You get to experience that. Play with the real world. Play with the thing that you're passionate about. Creating a culture of lifetime learning, including with your customers, is an essential way of building that engagement, building that trust, developing that relationship in the long term. I guarantee you, everyone in your ecosystem of stakeholders wants to learn something from you. And they want to teach other people that virtuous cycle of expertise. Um, Another kind of fun example, and, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll wrap this up. Another fun example for me comes uh, from the University of Washington, and this is a game called Fold It. And uh, for those of you who uh, haven't heard about this, basically when scientists want to discover important new drugs or understand how uh, diseases work, they need to know the structure of proteins like DNA and RNA. But you can't actually look at those under microscopes because they're too small. We don't have a microscope to look at them. So the way that you figure this out is a process called folding. You figure out the structure of a protein. It's through a process called folding where you interpolate, you try to guess what the structure of a protein is going to be. Now, scientists were trying to build software at the University of Washington that did that, but computers are not very good at it, while humans are actually very, very good intuitively at folding proteins. So they thought, is there a way that we can get humans to do this activity? So they built this game called Fold It. Okay? Now, for 15 years, scientists had been trying to discover an important protein structure in the fight against HIV, totally, totally stumped, had not been able to come up with the protein structure, and last year, 49,000 people playing Fold It for 10 days structured the protein. Wow. Right? Now, here's what's super interesting about this. So cool. You can watch uh, Seth Cooper, who designed it, talk on the G-Summit website. Fascinating. The most interesting thing about this design, though, to me, is they didn't hide the hard stuff. They could have hidden the protein folding, the activity of folding, in some kind of metaphor, like plant a garden, right, or, or harvest some crops or something, something where you were doing some metaphorical action and a computer was interpolated. They said, no, if we give you a higher purpose, you will want to do that activity. So instead of making the hard stuff dumb, they kept the hard stuff hard and made it fun and showed you your progress, how you were progressing, how your team was progressing, how the world was progressing, how close you were to that big goal, gave you a sense of higher purpose, connected everybody together, created a community, and managed to solve the problem. And here's my favorite thing about it. Of the people who played Fold It, only 50% had any math or science background at all. So the other 50% of people had absolutely no, um, no kind of experience with that, no experience with how to do uh, uh, math or science stuff. So pretty cool. The last thing that I, I want you guys to know from a design pattern that's critical is the notion of what we call SAPs in gamified design. And this is the hierarchy of rewards. This is what your customers, employees, your stakeholders, what they want from you in exchange for a job well done. Status, access, power, and stuff. They want that in order of stickiest to least sticky, most compelling to least compelling, and also conveniently for you, cheapest to most expensive. Right? <laughs> It's very important. You know, uh, any of you study Maslow's hierarchy of needs? You'll recognize this as being kind of the top, part of the top triangle of Maslow's hierarchy. And the thing is that, you know, it's not that people don't care about tangible rewards, like free tickets or whatever, but that fundamentally, 
uh, all rewards become habituated, which means that over time, you've got to give people bigger and bigger and more rewards. So therefore, you need to give them, you need to create a reward system that's easy for you to scale, where it's cheap or free for you to give people an increasing amount of rewards over time. And cash, in particular, is highly easy to habituate. Um, consider this example. Remember your first paycheck? Think back to your first paycheck, okay? So that first paycheck that you ever got, whether it was direct deposit or in your hands or in cash, I don't know what you were doing as your first job, but you, your first paycheck, yeah? Okay, so you get your first paycheck, you went home, right? And you were like, I'm rich, right? I'm gonna take you out for drinks. You took your friends out for drinks. You took your family out for dinner. It was so good, yes! Okay, when was the last time a paycheck produced that reaction in you? <laughs> right? Now, the only thing that you notice is when you don't get it. And that's an important lesson about tangible rewards. The more the rewards are tangible that you give people, the more they're going to have that reaction. They're not really going to value them as much when you give it to them over time, but they're definitely going to notice when you take them away. And so it's incredibly important to try as much as possible to produce virtual rewards. So one quick example of this, and we'll do Q&A. This is, uh, you guys all familiar with Gilt? It's a, a daily flash sale uh, for high-end luxury goods, mostly clothing. Okay. So if you're in the top 0.1% of shoppers on Gilt, the top 0.1%, you get inducted into what's called Gilt Noir, which is Gilt's high-end loyalty program. And top 0.1%, this is people who spend a lot of money, you get in the mail a little box from Gilt, a little black box. And inside is a scented candle, a gatefold brochure, and a black card. Now, do you get... Um, I don't know, discounts on the sale from Gil? Do you get one point for every dollar that you spend so you then get to redeem for anything on Gil? <laughs> no. Let me tell you what you get. Let me tell you what you get. Every day the Gilt auction starts at 12 o'clock. The Gilt sale starts at 12. If you're in Gilt Noir, your sale starts at 11.45. That's the sum total benefit of the loyalty program at Gilt. You get 15 extra minutes to spend money with the company. <laughs> right? Of course, you get your choice of stuff, yeah? But it's important to understand this is an access benefit in that status access power stuff model that we've talked about, giving people access to something. Those of you in the fundraising side of your business, you're experts at this. You do this stuff all the time. You think about status stuff all the time. I know you do. That knowledge, that understanding of how to motivate with status access and power instead of just free stuff needs to spread to the rest of the organization to create great engagement over the long term. All right, so in short, remember that kid Remy? We've talked about all these great examples. I hope these gamification examples were really interesting. And for many people, it feels like a nice to have idea that we can use gamification to raise engagement in a positive way because we, that would be good and we can differentiate ourselves and get people's attention and so on. But that generation, that next generation of consumers, that next generation of attendees, the Remy generation, 10, 12 years old and younger today, we have to do this in order to get their attention. We, don't, we have to level the playing field between our experiences, the way that we engage audiences, and the video games that they grew up playing. If our stuff isn't at least as rewarding as that, and I'm not saying it's got to be the same, I'm not saying the show's got to be a video game, but if it doesn't produce some of the same rewards, if it doesn't activate those same channels, feedback, friends, and fun, if it doesn't deliver status, access, power, and stuff to Remy in the way that he's accustomed to, it will be very difficult to get and maintain his attention. Any of you have two-year-olds in your life? playing with iPads? Ever handed an iPad to a two-year-old? See what happens? It's like they'll be gone for 16 years. The next thing you know, they'll, like they'll finally look up from the iPad when they graduate from high school. So it's like that. And so we need to set the bar higher. We need to think about ways that we can bring that together. And hopefully, uh, gamification is giving you some, uh, some sense of how to accomplish that. Um, so there's lots of great examples. There's more great examples up on the website. My Twitter handle is up here on the board. Now, the reason for that is that I hope this is the start of our friendship. Okay? I want us to be BFFs forever. And if you, um, underlined and heart, um, if you um, please connect with me on Twitter if you don't get a chance to ask questions tonight that you, uh, that you would like to ask, or if you like uh, food photos, you can be my friend on Facebook and share all those with me. Um, did you guys have any questions for our Q&A time? There are uh, microphones right here, so you can, you can ask away. They're turned on. <laughs> Sure, come on down. You're the next contestant. All right. Um, so let's say we are a theater company, 
And we create a game that allows people online to cast a show, to pick the players, like with the actual actors in the community. Mm -hmm. And then some kind of way, they come to the theater, and then if they, if they do it the best or the most people vote or something, then their play actually gets to be on stage with okay. their cast and their crew and blah, 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 blah. Okay. All right, and you got tweet people in the back, which a lot of theaters are doing. So, but at the same time with our art, right, where we want people to come into a room and actually not do those things all the time. We want people to focus. Yeah. How, can, how can we keep ourselves and also allow this new gaming thing that's happening to happen? Because I feel like we are a game as well. Like we are, sure. we are innovative, we are creators, we are creating stories. So how do we be open to this storytelling as well as keep our own? Sure, I think it's a, I think it's a great question. So, I, and I don't want to give you some kind of pat answer to it, so I want to tell you like honestly what I think. So because you are creators, you assume that the way to engage the audience is by evoking their creativity much the same way that you uh, would be engaged with creativity, right? This is, um, remember before when I alluded to the idea that fun is different for different people? Mm -hmm. So this example that you just gave, which is the audience gets to cast the show and decide the outcome and all this kind of stuff, the reason why that shit doesn't work is because the vast majority of people are not creative storytellers. Mm -hmm. If they were, they would be here, right? <laughs> no, no, seriously, seriously. Think, think about this for one second, think about it. This is a really, really big, this is a really big intellectual gap that a lot of people get caught in, they, they fall into this one. The tools to make a full-length feature film are available to every single person, basically, in the United States, completely for free. Its distribution is even available completely for free. It's right here, every single tool I need. Why don't people do that? They have all the tools, right? So it's a, it's a tautology to assume that the tools mean that what people have is also the creative instinct, the ability, and so on. What they pay you for, what they want from you is a great story, right? So the TV industry should be your guide for this. They have tried many kinds of gamification that are about uh, the audience deciding the ending of the story, the audience casting and stuff. And to be honest with you, the, that's always the first place they go, and those things never really work because that's not actually what the audience is good at or really what they want. They want a different kind of engagement. So um, some examples, you should check out uh, um, Jesse Redness from G Summit. Uh, he's from NBC. And they've done some really interesting gamification stuff that's been super successful around a bunch of different shows that might be a good blueprint for you. So instead of having the audience affect the outcome of the show, you leave the show intact and then let them play with the show outside of the show, yeah. right, around it. Let them, uh, the other thing which I think is, um, I think is a really, really sort of good example um, the, um, is the, at the core is this idea of letting people become experts. Mm -hmm. So uh, your audience, especially your more engaged audience, what they really want is they really want to be experts, right? And they are, many of them, I'm sure, theater experts. They're the theater nerds in your community, right? They're the ones going out on Monday night and like holding court at some local bar and talking about that time that they saw Patti LuPone and Gypsy or whatever, right? <laughs> and telling that story over and over and over again, okay? Those people want um, to be recognized for their expertise, status, benefits. So one of the easy hacks for you, one of the first places I would look if I were you, is how can you become the issuer of that credibility to that audience? That's one place I would start. That's where I would start with every project here. Give them what they're looking for, which is expertise, and allow them to then level up and move through the system. So things outside of the story is my first my first uh, assertion for you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for that question. And thank you for those boots. <laughs> They're very inspiring boots. Uh, do you have examples of uh, uh, a, any lower tech uh, versions of gamification? Obviously, there's a big sure. code entry and, and cost yes. entry to some of these. You know, to, for us to not think just so. I, I'm glad that you asked that question. Thank you so much for asking that question. So there's a common misunderstanding that we've got to like go out and write some software. And a lot of the examples that I showed you was go out and write some software, build some hardware, do something pretty complicated. But actually, gamification can be super low tech. Many companies do gamification with pen and paper. Or Excel spreadsheets are very powerful. Um, you might want to check out uh, the video. It's very inspiring. The speech by John Guerrera from last year's G Summit. He gamified his own life and uh, did it with post-it notes and um, helped him get a new job, write a book, uh, lose weight. It's awesome. It's just really inspiring. But one really good example that I like 
um, to get you thinking, because you brought up Monopoly, and everybody loved Monopoly in the room, I guess, um, is uh, there's this guy named Tim Vandenberg, and you can watch his talk as well on gsummit.com, uh, and I guarantee it's going to make you cry if you watch it. So only do it if you like a good tearjerker, <laughs> which I'm sure none of you do. Um, so, so Mr. Vandenberg um, is the number two ranked competitive Monopoly player in the United States, which is a thing, uh, by the way. <laughs> and um, in addition to that, he is a middle school math teacher in the Hesperia School District of, in Southern California's Riverside County. Now, Hesperia Schools, one of the most uh, impoverished and difficult school districts in America, 50% of the students at his school have a parent who's incarcerated uh, or has been incarcerated, involved in drugs or gangs or violence. This is not a high-performing school. This is not a wealthy environment. Okay? So about four years ago, Mr. Um, Mr. Vandenberg's school, in the, math, the California State Math Test, they had zero perfect scores, and they had about 10 students who got on the honor roll. And this past year, they've had 10 perfect scores and 40 students on the California State Honor Roll. And how they did that was with Monopoly. So if you are among the top math students of the year, you get to spend the last month of the school year playing Monopoly with Mr. Vandenberg. <laughs> That's what you do for a month. You play Monopoly. Now, it's not with the regular board, with the $13 paper Monopoly board, okay, that he has modified to use as a teaching tool that teaches probability, that teaches negotiation, cooperation, competition, math, economy, right? He teaches all those things using this very simple, uh, amazing paper, uh, paper board game called Monopoly. And you can watch his story and, and see the process by which we arrive at using uh, something this kind of uh, simple sort of pedagogy as a method. The best part about Mr. Vandenberg's story, it's the best part, half of those top performing students are girls. Right, which is amazing. It's actually amazing on multiple levels, but it's like an amazing outcome. And it, it's part of like a whole thought process. What's hard about gamification is not the execution. I've showed you lots of expensive examples, but it's not the execution, it's the design that goes into it. That's where, and, and many of you are super creative, and I think it will come naturally to you once you start thinking about it through this lens and through this prism. Any other questions? No? OK. Well, if not, I highly encourage you to, to grill me on Twitter uh, at great length. And I thank you guys very much for your time. Thank you for having me so much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.